Uh, Minister, the upcoming Singapore International Energy Week, I mean, what are some of the highlights and what do you hope will be achieved at this event? Well, the energy market is actually getting very exciting because of a lot of changes happening. I think the first thing that you see happening is this uh, huge drop in the prices for, for the renewables. So that's going to impact on the global energy market. And the second thing that we are actually seeing is that, you know, the co confluence of data managed uh, data enable energy management systems, the use of the smart grids, the use of data to balance the load between the day. And last but not least is this issue of the energy storage solutions, which is providing new options to enhance the reliability of our grid system. So the confluence of these three factors will make for a very interesting conference uh, in the next week. And then I, we hope to have the experts discuss the implications of all these three forces on the global energy market and how the emerging markets can tap on such opportunities to strengthen their resilience of their domestic grids. What is Singapore's role in this? Singapore currently chairs ASEAN. Mm -hmm. What role can it play in promoting green strategies mm -hmm. among its neighbours and the region? Uh, actually, Singapore is a very, very nice test bed. For many of these new technologies, we are in what we call the Goldilocks position. We are a city uh, which can serve as a model for many of the other urban centres in the world. But we are not, not too big and not too small. Because when it's too big, it's hard to scale up and hard to make many of these changes at the system level. But when it's too small, you are not very sure whether it can be whatever you try is scalable. So we are in this, what we call the Goldilocks position, a city of about 5 million, and then you can try many of these new and innovative solutions. For example, what we talked about just now, you know, the <coughs> use of uh, data to enable better energy management. How do you manage the peak and the trough within the day? How do you help people to uh, optimize the use of their electricity throughout the daily cycle. So these are experiences that I think we can share with uh, cities in uh, Southeast Asia and perhaps not just Southeast Asia but also beyond Southeast Asia. Take a look at the longer term, a 10, 15, 20 year time frame. Mm -hmm. What is Singapore's own energy strategy? Because it wants to move away mm -hmm. from being totally reliant on natural gas for instance, looking at solar and wind as well. Mm -hmm. so, so actually there are uh, three parts to our strategy. The first part as you said is to shift the balance between fossil fuels and renewables. So today, I think we are rapidly growing the dependence on renewables and reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. So that is, I think, one set of balance. Now, the second set of balance is to make sure that we have a smarter grid, to make sure that it's more resilient, make sure that it is uh, more affordable. And this is where data comes in, because we are able to collect a lot of the data on how we use energy in Singapore by different industry, by different segments of the population, by different time cycles. And with this data, uh, all this data, we are able to actually optimize how we design our energy uh, grid system. But then the, yet, there's a third part that I think we are going to focus a lot of attention, and that is the design of our precincts, the design and use of our various uh, products that we have. So, for example, I think a lot of people talk about just the production of energy and the usage of energy, but what they do not realise is that, you know, how you design your precinct, how you, the materials that you use for your various products uh, makes a lot of difference. So, I give a very tangible example. A lot of people in the tropics uh, would like to use a lot of air conditioning and that's highly energy intensive. But how do you design your building to allow the natural light to come in to, to allow a natural ventilation so that you reduce the consumption of energy. What's the kind of building materials that you use that can reduce the energy consumption for a typical building? Uh, I mean, I think a lot of people are now talk talking about the zero emission building mm. and some people mm. are talking about below zero. That means you can be a net positive, a net gain in terms of energy rather than be a net consumption. Uh, so I think these are many exciting opportunities that we can look into in terms of how Singapore can share our expertise with the rest of the world in terms of energy usage. How soon will Singapore realise that goal? I don't think you have a time when you can say that you have arrived. You know, energy management is a work in constant progress. So the rebalancing between fossil and renewables depends on the pace of technological advances and I think we are in the correct direction and we just want to make sure that we continue on that trajectory. Uh, how to use data to enable better energy usage management, I think that is also that is uh, ever uh, ongoing. And likewise on the third part on how to better use uh, materials for 
some of this uh, to reduce the energy consumption. I think that's also ongoing. But our goal, just like the water story in Singapore, is to make ourselves much less dependent on external energy supplies and much less dependent on fossil energy supplies. Uh, Singapore will be the first country to impose a carbon tax. Uh, one of the first. <laughs> one of the first in the region at least. Yes. Um, and it amounts to five sing dollars. And some say that is not enough mm -hmm. to perhaps decarbonize the mm -hmm. country. Well, I'll make a couple of points on this. Uh, first, we run a very transparent system. Uh, the difference between Singapore's way of uh, pricing carbon and many other cities is this. We run a fixed price so that we don't distort the market. And then, we, if necessary, we will encourage use the revenue to encourage a more uh, efficient methods of production for energy. Whereas in many other countries, they run a very complex uh, pricing mechanism with different tiers. And what it means is that it is very difficult to run the market efficiently. So that's our approach. The second point that I'd like to make is that um, this carbon tax for us is not a revenue measure. It is actually to use the revenue collected from here to incentivize uh, other more efficient produce, uh, more producers, more efficient producers of the energy. So actually for us, uh, we want to see the market adjust, but it is not a revenue measure for us per se. We want to see the market adjust towards a more efficient production. Now having said that, we, are always, uh, we always have a big challenge. And that is because in Singapore, we have a, big, a huge petrochemical industry. Mm. Actually, we are one of the most efficient, one of the cleanest producers of all these specialized specialty chemicals in the world. But unfortunately, because of the size of our population and the size of our land area, uh, we get penalized because we don't have that set of quota. But if you think about it, actually, we are producing it in a more efficient way for the rest of the world. If those products are not produced in Singapore, they would have been produced somewhere else, probably with less efficient, less green, less clean methods. So we do what we can to make sure that even though we are at the frontiers of the technological curve, we are continuing to push forward to make sure that it takes care of not just our responsibility to the rest of the world, but also to benefit the rest of the world by ha having a more efficient, a greener, a cleaner production methods. So no reason to think that you could go the World Bank way, which is suggesting 50 to $100 no. instead of what Singapore is targeting, eventually 10 to 15 well, that is something that we will have to see as the market evolves. So we have set in place the mechanism and we have every intention to make sure that it's a robust, transparent mechanism. As to the actual price level, that will depend on how the market evolves and we will take it at a, one step at a time. Minister, I want to touch on trade. I mean, there's growing concern about the US-China trade war. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on it and how is Singapore, which is very exposed to the trade, uh, how is Singapore being impacted by that? Yeah. So, uh, a couple of points again. I think first, I, in today's world, it's very difficult to imagine a product being produced just in one particular country, unless you're talking about very basic primary product, agricultural products. But if you take a, a smartphone, something that we use every day, it's impossible to imagine that being produced just in one country the number of parts required, the, the type of materials required, the sales uh, team required, the programming efforts required. It is actually a cross-border operation. It's a multi-country operation. So I think globalization benefits everyone. And if globalization is to be disrupted, actually everyone suffer. So in the current <coughs> US-China trade tensions, I think in the short term, you would you, you will see that many of the companies cannot make the short-term adjustments, perhaps only at the margin. But in the longer term, it will lead to shifts in the global production chain, and it will lead to shifts in the global value chain. And this <coughs> will mean that there will be some parts of the economy that will be net, uh, will get net benefits, and some people will find that they were net losers. Because in this shift of the, the global production chain, you never know whether there is a net positive or a net negative for some, some countries. Having said that, even if in the middle term, some countries benefit and some countries lose, I think what is more worrying for everyone is that the entire global economy loses confidence. If that is the case, there will be a huge impact on the financial market, on the investment market, 
And if the whole level of, uh, the entire level of global economic activity slows down, then I think it will impact everyone negatively. And this impact will wipe out the relative shifts um, that we talked about earlier. Do you see that happening? <coughs> do you see confidence being impacted? And do you see the trade war being prolonged? Uh, this is early days. If the trade war is going to be prolonged, it will definitely impact on the global confidence. So this is something that we are watching closely. So if I may summarize it, there are two sets of forces. One is the short to medium term uh, implications where there are shifts in the global production chain and the global value chain. Some people will gain, some people will lose, but net off, it might be manageable. But there's a longer term impact and that's on the global confidence on the market. And that I think we have to watch carefully because if that coincide with what many people are expecting in terms of a global uh, downturn because of the technicalities, then I think we will be in for a rough ride. Can Singapore and the rest of Southeast Asia benefit somewhat from the tweaks <coughs> in the global supply chain? Uh, so that is the first part of the story. In the short to medium term, some sectors, some countries may benefit because of the uh, shifts in the global value chain. But I think we have to be very careful because those gains might be entirely wiped out if there is a larger set of force at play, which is the loss of global confidence. And if the entire WTO system breaks apart, everyone, everyone will be worse off. And that, I think, is what worries us. How is Singapore and Singapore businesses <laughs> navigating and preparing for such a possibility? So from Singapore's perspective, we need to do two things well. The first is the external facing. We need to work with like-minded partners to uphold the global trading system, to continue to have the free trade agreements either bilaterally or multilaterally, to make sure that our global trading system remains open, free and rule-based. Now internally, as a maturing economy, we have to make sure that we can recycle our factors of production uh, efficiently from the less productive sectors to the more productive se sectors. This means retraining our workers to upskill them to make sure that they can seize the opportunities of the new sectors, the new markets. It means that we have to have a more agile land uh, policy to make sure that again we recycle land from the less productive sectors to the, the more productive sectors. And we will continue to make sure that we have an uh, open system that welcomes uh, globally talented teams to work in Singapore. This means Singaporeans working with global talent to make sure that we have the strongest team Singapore to compete with the rest of the world and to offer attractive propositions for the rest of the world. Minister, just one final question. The biggest risk you see <coughs> for the Singapore economy and for the global economy? The biggest risk will be the collapse of the open rule-based trading system that we have, that have brought us so far. I'm not saying that the WTO system is perfect. The WTO system will always need to be tweaked and continually improved upon, especially in many of the new sectors that we're talking about, the fintech, the data sectors, which previously did not exist and which previously did not have the rules to govern them. So, so we need to build new rules. But having said that, the WTO system is what we have now. It has provided us the conditions to generate the kind of economic growth that the world has seen. It is not perfect, but let not the perfect be the enemy of the good. So I think we need to uphold what we have now while continually tweaking the system to improve it. But if the, that global trading system collapses because people turn isolationist, people turn inward, then we might be back to where we were 100 years ago near the Great Depression era where everybody thought that it was better for them to close their borders and just work in isolation. And if that happens, I think it's a grave risk for the entire world. All right. Minister, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank, thank you. you.